here again with another edition of Patience on the News. Tonight we're talking talk about political parties. I have as my guest uh, the chairman of the main state Republican Party, Demi Kazunis. And I should say at the outset, Kazunis, Patious. You get two Greeks tonight. <laughs> so we're, uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, parties. And Demi, I want to welcome you to the show. You've been on once before. You did a nice job. So we thought we'd get you back to uh, for another appearance. Uh, and I want to begin uh, with the audience by reading something from Federalist Number 10, the Federalist Papers. This was written by James Madison, the primary writer of the US Constitution. It was published in the New York newspaper on November 23, 1787. I also want to say as a matter of background, we talked a lot about, you know, pushing back against the elitists and condemning elitists. And it seems to be a big issue in our country today. But these people who formed this nation, the founding fathers, if they were nothing else, they were elitists. They were the educated class in America, all of them pretty much university uh, graduates. And they had the point of view, uh, intellectual point of view of elitists. So you sometimes have to take what they say with a grain of salt, grain of salt. But they were thoughtful people. And so we're gonna talk about political parties, which they called factions at the beginning of our country. And so Madison writes, and I think this is very important, and, and, and indeed I would suggest everybody watching this program, go online, just type in Federalist Number 10 and read it for yourselves because it's, it's fascinating. Madison says, as long as the reason of man continues fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed. As long as the connection subsists between his reason and his self-love, his opinions and his passions will have a reciprocal influence on each other. The diversity of the faculties of men from which the rights of property originate is not less an insuperable obstacle to uniformity of interests. Insuperable obstacle to uniformity of interests. No such thing as uniformity of interests. The latent causes of faction are thus sown in the nature of man. And there you have it from Madison. The real problem is us, our nature, who we are. A zeal, says Madison, a zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and many other points. An attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power, attachment to individual leaders, or to persons whose fortunes have been interesting to human passions, have in turn divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. And he goes and says one more thing, which I find interesting. He said, so strong is this propensity of mankind to fall into mutual animosities that where no substantial occasion presents itself, nothing real important presents itself, says Madison, he says, even then, even then, 
the factual, the, the, the most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. Even, says Madison, when it isn't really important. Even, says Madison, when it really makes no difference to us. Still, these differences will inflame our passions. And so we begin with that, and that's the basis of political parties. And they recognized it. And they thought they, they, thought they were designing a system of government to keep those passions and animosities and differences in check. They thought that the only way to overcome human nature in this problem was to have a government that could regulate it. And he says at the end, or near the end, the regulation of these various and interfering interests form the principal task of modern legislation and involves the spirit of party and faction. So government it was designed, they thought, to mitigate these differences, these animosities, these passions that arose from the nature of human beings. And certainly it's being tested today. It truly is being tested. And we're going to find out. And remember, we've had one failure. We had one failure in 1861, the Civil War, where it all broke down and came apart. So it can happen. And Madison and his cohorts must have done OK because Humpty Dumpty got put back together again for how long, we do not know. All right, Demi, I made my speech. Thank you for listening. Well, we're going to talk. Now we're going to go let you let, uh, talk a little. I was going to say, so, you must know my big fat Greek family when you, you, may, <laughs> when you talk about Why, they you do know, that? Well, I, I, I suspect, you know, you, oh, get, oh. Uh, you get families, you get friends together, and you're going to have a varied opinion. Um, I think that we all are different and have different opinions is uh, what human nature is all about. Um, it's how to organize the thought and come up with a common goal that is always the issue in government. So, I mean, well, that's true. I, I mean, I, I think it's I think that's what government is all about, anyway. So it's it's a uh, it's a um, you know getting the um, the folks to come together, collaborate. And for the greater good, for the greater good of civilization. No. So Demi, so Demi, so political parties have evolved, and uh, we've had periods in history where they've disappeared altogether. For instance, the Whigs, and the Republicans were the successors uh, to the Whigs. We had the Know Nothing Party, uh, which was very influential for a period of just two or three years. It was basically uh, an anti-immigrant party and mostly focused on. Uh, getting rid of Catholics and getting them out of the country. But uh, basically, uh, since the Civil War, it's been Republicans and Democrats and made up of, of, of different shifting sands of population. And uh, the Democratic Party, you remember, was the party of the South and the party of segregation and uh, and the Republican Party was the abolitionist party, uh, designed and, and built to do away with uh, slavery. In 1964, when Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, Democrats had been beneficia beneficiaries of a solid Democratic vote in the South. Every member of Congress, uh, but with a couple of exceptions uh, from the South was a Democrat. And uh, every time there was a presidential election prior to 1964, uh, Democrats carried other Southern state and it got every single electoral vote uh, from the South, except when uh, 
uh, Senator Thurman uh, ran in the Dixocrat, uh, under the Dixocrat banner in 1948. However, Johnson, when he signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, said, we've just turned the South over to the Republican Party for my generation, and he said to Bill Moyers, for your life as well, for your lifetime as well. And he was right, it shifted. So now we have this lineup of the different parties. And in, by 1980, it began to, the party system uh, began to matter more. In those days prior to then, uh, there were a lot of moderate Republicans and there were a lot of moderate Democrats and there was a real center in the legislature, in the Congress. There isn't any more. There's no real center, it's rare. Susan Collins is a rare bird. Uh, so uh, when I was the chairman of the Maine Democratic Party in 1977, Hattie Bickmore, the Republican chair and I were on PBS, a big special, a one hour special on PBS called What's a Party For? Featuring the Maine Republican and Democratic state chairs. And the problem that the parties had then was they were becoming irrelevant. People said, there's not much difference between these two parties. You know, they're pretty much in the middle and uh, what do we need them for? And hence the title, what's a party for? Now there is a big difference, a huge difference between the two parties. And party seems to mean everything in Congress, both for the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, the party system has overtaken the congressional system. So it's dominating everything. So tell us about the party. Tell us about, we'll have somebody on from the main Democratic Party, but tell us about the Republican Party. You can, people probably don't even know how it's, how it's put together. What does it consist of? Representatives from different areas and so forth. Why don't you describe it? Well, first of all, um... I think, uh, and, and again, I come into politics from a, I'm a science-based person. I'm a, I started college as a math person and I got a ZOE degree and then went to dental school. So I see things a little bit more from the human nature point of view than I do from history and politics. I, 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 I look at everything a little bit differently, which is kind of an interesting perspective from my, my point of view. Um, I think that, um, that the, the, our country is the best country in the world because we have a pendulum that swings back and forth. And sometimes it really swings pretty hard one direction and goes over to the other direction. Other times the pendulum does a little, little bit smaller sweeping uh, movements. But at this point we're, we've got, we went from Obama to Trump and now to Biden. And so the, the swing is great. Co causing huge polarizations in our country. Um, we typically are, because human nature being so, there's always two sides, not three sides or four sides, two sides mainly that uh, creates how we think. And then we look for that middle area where we can get along. Um, I uh, got involved more with the Republican party. I think back when I ran in 2012, I ran on an issue of um, uh, from healthcare, uh, and it was very personal to me, which a lot of times people get involved in politics because it's very personal to them. Um, but I, we had uh, an issue with addiction in my family. And so I chose to put on my platform that we reduce the amount of prescription drugs that are written by healthcare and have it. In other words, half have, if I want to prescribe 12 Vicodin to you, I would pres prescribe six and then with a refill to force you to go back to the drugstore to get the other half. And most of the time people don't need all 12 anyways, and it wouldn't be out in the streets or they wouldn't be stolen from grandma's house. And that's where my platform started. Um, and then um, I lost that race, but I didn't stop there, I continued on and very quickly went from being executive member of the York County to then becoming the vice chair under Rick Bennett and then becoming chair and just getting uh, reelected for my third time. Um, what, how does it work? We have every county has a chairman from every county voted by the Republicans of that county. We have a committee man, a committee woman. So that's at least three members of every single county 
And then depending on how large the county is, you have at large positions. For every 10,000 Republicans, there's another representative. So the party that represents the Republican party in the state, in, in my case, uh, has about 75 members and I'm the chairperson uh, of that. And I'm basically I'm the coach of that group. I hold the team together. We work things out. We develop a platform. We uh, discuss uh, bylaws, uh, financial budget that we have to discuss. Um, and the party basically represents um, what we believe in, which is individual freedom, limited government, fiscal responsibility, the rule of law, uh, peace through strength, the sanctity of life and free market. And those are the basic, I wrote these down this morning, those are the basic beliefs that we have. For me, um, um, the sanctity of life is huge. I am, I'm, I'm a, I call myself a tree hugging tightwad, which means that I'm basically a huge uh, environmentalist animal rights. And it's very hard for me to stomach um, that we would, you know, have, you know, shelters for animals and, and, you know, I'd be the first one to pick up a squirrel on the side of the road and try to mother it and bring it to a vet that we're okay with late term abortion. It's not something I can fathom. Uh, so that's a big issue for me. And, uh, fiscal responsibility, I think is very important to me because our government can swell where it becomes a, uh, an entity in itself to, to survive. And we have to be careful because it really exists because of us not in spite of us. So um, that those are the, this is how um, I view my party. This is why I'm the chairperson of the party. And um, other than that, why am I doing it? I don't know. You, you asked me if I was gonna do it for 30 years more and that would get me to be weak, wicked old at that point, wicked old. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, it's fair to say that in both uh, major parties, the uh, they're run by activists, people that uh, are sufficiently interested to go to meetings, to help organize things. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, we're not demeaning it by saying it's a game, but if people do get engaged by it. And, uh, and they're in what we call the quote, political game. Uh, I, I often recall when I'm talking about these things, a trip I took in Russia with a uh, prominent group of half dozen prominent uh, Communist Party members back in 1980. And one of them was a Jewish guy from Azerbaijan. And Misha was his name. He was a good guy. And, uh, but he was Jewish, which was unusual for Communist Party functionaries to be Jewish because uh, they were prejudiced against them. And um, I said to him, I was standing at the bar next to him, and I said, Misha, what are you doing as a, you know, full-time communist party apparatchik, you know, official? You're a Jew. And he looked at me and he says, Mr. Pesh, you Democrat, right? Yes. You meet a lot, lot of people? Be Democrat? Yes. You have good contacts? Be Democrat? Yes. Me too, he said. So that explained a little bit about uh, political activity uh, on the part of some people. So, all right. So, pe some people say, well, look, the Republican Party needs to broaden itself. It needs to be open to more people. I looked at the enrollment figures for this past year, uh, Secretary of State's office, and in Maine, there are 300, these are rounded to the nearest uh, thousand, 387,000 people registered as Democrats, 340,000 people res not in a party, independents, right. and, and 295,000 uh, who are Republicans. So there's almost 100,000 fewer Republicans than Democrats. Is that, right, you win elections, and Susan Collins got elected. Uh, so, um, what can be done about that? And the other thing I wanted to ask you about, which I think is related to that, because it's demographic. If you look at a political map of the state of Maine, 
you see a thin blue line going up the coast to Maine from Kittery to Bar Harbor. And 95% of the state is red and just that little thin, very narrow blue line going up the coast. Any ideas on why that is? Yeah, I, I live in that thin blue line, so <laughs> I understand it. Um, my neighbors, most of them, and I grew up in Saco, um, have moved here from out of state. Um, my town of Saco at one time was a town uh, of 8,000 people. Now it's a city of 23,000 people. And probably two thirds of these folks are out of state as they moved in. Uh, and they're bringing, of course, with them their politics um, so you'll see a lot of that. Uh, it's interesting that New Hampshire, I'm friends with the chair of New Hampshire, it's his CD1, which is the southern part of his state that's Republican, and it's the northern part that's more Democratic. So, uh, and I have often asked him, is it because it borders and it closer to Vermont? Who knows? But it is interesting why we think it's probably just basically that's where a lot of folks move up from out of state. They, they love our beaches. They love that area of Maine. They can, they can buy um, a little bit of Maine, you know, paradise living in the coast. And like I said, they probably bring their politics with them. Um, but yeah, it, Republicans are an inter interesting lot of people. They're very, as I, I said before, they're very much into uh, freedom, individual freedom. And so a lot of them may be Republicans, but they, they call themselves unenrolled as to not be bothered, as to be maybe even a little off the grid and be able to do what they wanna do. So even though, yeah, with 295, we're probably got quite a bit of that, you know, independent group that's part of the Republican Party. They do decide most of the elections, by the way, that middle third is what decides which way election will go, depending if we, if our messaging uh, fits what they're looking for. I think you, I, I, I think you're probably right. In the last uh, uh, election, uh, Biden got, uh, say it another way, Gideon got 347,000 votes, uh, 347. Biden got 90,000 votes more than Gideon did. So those are independents going to him in large measure. And some Democrats, and, and, and maybe a few Republicans, I know some Republicans who voted for Biden, several in fact. Uh, and then uh, Trump got 361,000 votes, uh, so uh, 80,000 less than Biden. And, but Susan Collins, Susan Collins got 60,000 votes that Trump didn't get. And so she, she vastly exceeded the Trump vote. So that had to be a lot of independents as well that vote for Susan Collins. They normally do, don't they? Yeah, I, it was an interesting so, situation. Okay. I think a couple of things happened. I think first of all, our state is, is, an, is the oldest state in the country. And so you're going to have folks that may be voting. And again, I, this, this felt a lot of a personality vote this time around. I think they may have felt more connected to Biden than to Trump on this vote because probably the coronavirus. I think also um, the ranked choice voting that the Democrats have been touting, um, I think came to haunt them because Lisa Savage uh, told a lot of folks out there, vote for me first and Sarah Gideon second, which is what they did. Um, and they, that took a whole lot of votes away from Sarah Gideon. Um, and I think folk, folk, folks felt that they could trust Susan Collins with the state of Maine more than they could trust Sarah Gideon. Uh, and I think it showed at the ballot box. So um, the two parties that, that decide who the candidates are gonna be in November. Basically the Democratic Party and the Republican Party will decide it and they decide it with primaries. And uh, that gives you and the Democrat 
Democrat, Democrat Party a lot of power because we end up with basically two choices and they're your choices. And they're made by a, a rather small number of people in the primary. Not a lot of people vote in a primary unless it's a big broadly contested uh, primary. So uh, you can nominate somebody who uh, basically uh, that is, does not have a broad base of support. But when it comes down to just two people, now the vote in November is maybe for many people, the lesser of two evils. And so uh, ranked choice voting is supposed to help alleviate that by trying to get people to be more moderate in their, or candidates to be more moderate. Uh, you don't like ranked choice voting, I trust. Uh, I, I, hope, I hope the folks out there that are listening uh, understand what happened with ranked choice voting for the uh, Senate race. I mean, how well did that work for them? And I don't see the rancor, rancor uh, any less, less money spent, less let's go along to get along kind of feel going on. So do I think, I think it costs the state, what, $100,000 to collect all the paper ballots, go up to Augusta and then have to figure it out. Yeah, I think it's ridiculous. On the other side, uh, we're still using paper ballots uh, because of ranked choice voting. That might be actually not a bad thing so, you know, with every issue, there's some good and bad, and you have to figure out what you want, um, how to, your state to run, and at the end, majority wins, and, and that's how it's going to be. But I don't think it did. It, it, it helped Sarah Gideon one bit. Well, we did. In fact, well, one of the things is she was running against a very popular incumbent. Susan Collins has a lot of support. So, uh, you know, these technical things may help or hurt a candidate, but most important is uh, whether the candidate has supporters and whether they think the candidate does a good job. And in the case of a person who's been in the Senate for 24 years, it's uh, do they think she's done a good job? So uh, there are a lot of things that, that affect uh, the outcome of these elections. Do, in, do, do you think that Donald, uh, do you think that uh, that uh, Joe Biden uh, won the election? Do you think he was he was the winner, or do you think it was stolen, as they say? Stolen. Yeah. So I I think that popular vote did go to Biden. I think there were many irregularities in the states, um, and I think we, I think seventy four million people feel that something happens, something doesn't feel right to them, and to disregard their feelings is to, as I would say to somebody, is to put your hand over their mouth trying to muzzle them. It doesn't, it doesn't help our party, it doesn't help our, our government, it doesn't help anybody, and so we still need some investigating going on. There, there needs to be one election day, we need to not be peppered by ballots, we need to have um, you know, voter, uh, vo decide on how we want to vote or register. Do we do same day, do it, we do it weeks before. And finally, uh, I think that uh, a lot of people have issues, a lot of people are not comfortable with, uh, I don't know, voting machines. That all needs to be looked at. I can tell you, as the chair of the party, I think that there are a lot of people out there that don't feel that their vote mattered. And that's a bad thing for our country. And do you think in the states that Trump won, they feel their vote mattered? I think the state of Maine, personally, there might've been some voter irregularities and some, uh, we, we may be looking at, uh, you know, in some bigger cities to find out if there was same day registration and has the clerks gone back to look at these registrations because that's part of their job to look to see if that person still resides or should they be taken off the voter roll? Uh, I think there might be some issues in Maine, but I think our state did good. I think there are other states like Pennsylvania and Georgia where uh, you know, our, our folks were asked to leave and then they continued counting after they left. There, there is some questions that need to be answered. 
And and I've looked into that and I would, I would suggest to people watching this program, uh, this issue that was brought to the courts incidentally of uh, the, the claim that uh, the Republican, the counts, the, 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 the voting counts continued after the Republican poll watchers left. Uh, you can get all the information on that off the internet. And of course there were 60 some odd lawsuits brought. That's one of the things we do in this country is, is use the courts to resolve these things. So I think back to my question, do you think that in the states that Trump won, there were voting irregularities? That Trump won? Yeah, let's take Alabama and Mississippi. Do you, right. That Trump won easily in those states. Do you think right. they were voting? Do you think that the vote was uh, improper and illegitimate? The maven. I mean, I, I have I I haven't looked at the voting at all. I can only talk about the state of Maine. I can't talk about any other states. But I think that we need to come back around and discuss how voting occurs. If a a large, huge group of people in the United States feel something's not right and that there might have been some irregularities. I think I think the masses want it to be looked at. And I think that's the job of our government to take a closer look at how we vote. People did not feel that their votes were counted, whatever, whatever they feel. I'm not gonna be the one to say, no, you shouldn't be feeling like that. Because we know that hum humans need to be heard from that's that's the role of government we hear you but this is what's going to happen or this law is going to happen or you know that's the role of government um that's that's not, we're not talking about a few million we're talking about like 74 million so i think that there needs to be some greater look at what happened during this elections and why so many people feel disenfranchised well the Republicans, I assume, were organized and they did have people watching at the polls and they did have lawyers and they did uh, bring cases. And so I'm a lawyer, so I think things can be proved. Uh, I've spent my life in the law and I think that's what the judicial process is all about. Uh, and that's what you mentioned rule of law. Rule of law is all about. So. Uh, rule of law was employed, cases were brought, but there was no evidence. So at a certain point, do we need to say to the 74 million people that you say feel disenfranchised, uh, look, there is no evidence. Where's the evidence that, the, that this election was stolen? The fact of the matter is the 74 million people, they have heard a president who they adore, who they adore, they don't like, they adore, I don't understand why, because I don't think he's that kind of an attractive human being, but they <laughs> adore him, okay? They adore him. So- I, I uh, think your wife will be very happy to hear that from you. Yeah. So go ahead. And he, yeah, and, <laughs> and well, no, I don't, uh, he, he's probably a good enough looking guy, but he doesn't <laughs> have the personal characteristics that appeal to me. But in any event, um, I, I, I just think that if you're told a certain thing, you know, if we know through history, you said something about, well, you're a scientist, not a historian. But if you read history, you know that if certain thing, they call it the big lie, is said over and over again. The communists did it all the time, the big lie. And, and so did Hitler. It, it, it affects people, they believe it. And so of course these people are gonna believe it. Almost every Republican member of Congress says the election was stolen. That's why they, and so these people get worked up. They said, all oh, these leaders that I admire so much say this election was unfair, it was stolen. I'm gonna believe it. So it starts at the top, not at the bottom, I, I think. Anyway. And, 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 what, and what did the uh, left-leaning media do? They shut down the the ability for these folks to communicate because they're going to shut steal a vote down you what what has happened is it only intensified these people's thoughts so let's talk about the big lie the big lie won't be a big lie if you allow it to go out there be dissected be looked into 
evaluated and at the end realize that maybe there was no big lie. Though what the, what the left-leaning media is doing is the biggest mistake of all, is to shut down communication. And I think that it will come back to bite them. We, if what, we, what, what do you mean shut down communication? The, the Wall Street Journal is shutting down communication? Uh, let's not talk about newspapers because I can tell you Anybody probably 55 and under doesn't even know what a newspaper looks like anymore. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, let's right. talk about uh, media like Twitter, Facebook, um, oh God, other platforms. I can't even think of them at all. I, I mean, I only know like three or four because I'm old, but that's beside the point. But you, they've shut down. There's so many people that I know that have their Facebook groups taken off. They're being censored. Uh, they're not allowed on Twitter. A lot of people that I know, not one or two or three, a lot of people. When you do that, and let's just say you're thinking there's a big lie, and they're not allowed to continue to discuss their feelings and their thoughts, and then have these media people allow different thoughts so that people can, can be educated, you've just took their thoughts and intensified it. You're, it's a mistake. Uh, there you go. The freedom of the marketplace. There we are. Republican precept. Freedom of the of, of the marketplace. These are private companies, mm -hmm. and they run their business, and they're free. Free. So they're they want to be. They 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 are, and they want to be free of government interference. Okay. okay? They want to be free of government interference. Yeah, yeah. And so we're and, in silence. No, no, no. I'm just saying. That's what they say. So oh, I know what they say. And, and 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 let me say, I'm just copying what many Republicans say to me. Anybody who wants to start a media company, that's a, let's say a right wing Republican, is free to do it. Mm -hmm. Is free to do it, and nobody will tell them who to shut off or who to put on or who to, who to take off. So any Republicans who want to start, just like they did with. Uh, with Fox News, start your own. Oh, okay. Free to and do I, it. This and is I, America. And I think anybody out there that has Facebook and Twitter stock should consider on you know dumping them because half the country is going to go ahead and and uh, um, basically get off as soon as a new media is. But I'm explaining to you that the big lie. You have to be careful because the first thing that Hitler did is to then stop any basically anybody from uh, putting out a view that was probably anti-Hitler. Shutting down um, communication is, is in my mother and my mother grew up in, in Greece during World War II. So she saw it and she'll be the first one to tell me that this is not good when people can't talk and communicate with each other. You're, you know, I certainly wouldn't argue that, but I would say that one critical difference Hitler was the government. The government shut down communication. Do you think that Joe Biden set, shut shut down or is shutting off people from uh, the these uh, media companies? So, so for the average high school graduate out there, what do you think they think? I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm looking at facts. I'm not. I I I can't go on the basis so of you, what. So Biden is in. And left-leaning media has shut communication off of all Republicans. So, what does it look to the high school graduate out there yeah. who can't? I, I think I think Republicans are communicating fine, okay. And okay. I don't think anybody's shut down thing. I think it is true. And, and, and you're a Democrat, and I'm a Republican, and I'm trying to tell you how they feel. And I'm trying to explain to you they feel that they have had their 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 way of communicating that pl their platform removed so that they can't continue to communicate. They feel basically locked out and they're angry about it. I, I understand what you're saying and uh, uh, and I understand you're promoting this this view that they've been locked out, but the fact remains that there are facts and yeah. and, I'm not, and, and I'm not promoting it. I am I'm just communicating and letting you know how they feel. I, I don't know how they feel. Look, I read all about the conspiracies. I read about QAnon. I read all this stuff. I know how people feel and I'm sympathetic sometimes with them, sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, but, but I know how people feel.
But facts are what really counts, facts. Because once we, we go just on how people feel, if you can stir up people, you know, there are people, there are politicians around who know how to stir up people. And not all of them are Republicans. And we've had some populist demagogues who have been Democrats. So if it's okay for a Republican, it's okay for a Democrat and we're gonna have them. The only thing standing between us and that kind of chaos are facts. And facts are very, very important and always have been. And no democracy can operate without facts. So that's all, that's all I'm saying, Demi. Demi, what if, let, 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 let's uh, uh, move on. I read, I read the, uh, you're going to have a meeting. And first of all, I happen to know Susan Collins is an admirer of yours and your friends. Okay. I love so, Susan Collins. And, and that, that pleases me because I like you and I like it when, when important and very smart politicians like you. So, okay, so I like that fact. So, so uh, and I know what it's like to be a state chairman. You've got a lot of different groups to take care of and try to keep them all happy. And it is very, very difficult. Yes. So not only that, but the state chairman has to, can't, can't say no to people in their organization that want to do something. They have to give them the opportunity, the freedom to speak and to be heard. And I understand that's the job of the state chairman. So I looked at, uh, I know you're going to have on the 13th or 14th of uh, this month, a uh, meeting in which you're going to consider what you're going to say to Susan Collins again. And uh, I'm not going to put you on the spot because I know that that's boiling up in your party. Exactly. So uh, I read the letter that was sent to Susan Collins, and I also read Susan Collins's response, which uh, I thought, I'm not trying to stir up trouble here, dude, but I thought her response was, was a good one. She said, she's the only member of Congress in, from all of New England that's a Republican. True. Only one in the whole region. Uh, that's pretty good. She's kind of important that she's able to get elected when nobody else is. In all of the Senate races, she was the only one, only one who outpolled the, the president, Republican presidential candidate in all the states in which they had Senate races. The only one in the United States. Yes. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Seems to me she's pretty good at politics. Yes. And, and I think the Democrats would love to have, we don't have it, you know, do, but the Democrats would love to have a senator like that. So I, what I, I read the letter and I saw in there that probably your hand, there were some awfully nice things that were said in the letter about Susan Collins. You don't have to say yes or no, but <laughs> I, I see your hand in this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but uh, you have to keep everybody uh, uh, happy. But I do want to say a couple of things. You said that, uh, uh, you said, the letter said that, um, said some of us have serious concerns of the way the House managers in the impeachment altered the video of President Trump. It said they tried to fool us with this video. Now, I've been, I, I've been <laughs> watching TV the last few months. I actually saw it, and I think most people in this country saw it. They saw the president speaking, they had film of him, they have both video and audio of him speaking. Everything that's going on, they've had video and audio of him saying the election was stolen, I did not lose, I won, all of that. So we don't need the house managers to tell us what happened. We all know, every citizen in this country that looks at TV or listens to the radio knows what happened. So that business about altering the house managers, they think that the house managers actually changed people's opinion of what happened. People can decide for themselves what happened. They saw it. So uh, I didn't like that. And um, 
it was all about the prosecution. What Susan Collins says is that uh, she says he's, he stoked it. He stoked the insurrection. That's her view. So why don't they just say, look, I mean, I'm not asking you to defend everybody's position here. It's, you, you, have, you have your ideas, everybody has their own ideas, but what can happen to Susan Collins? Nothing other than to say, we don't like it. I'm sure they've all written her letters telling her she's a rhino, she's this, she's that. Uh, somebody in the state committee, I hope will say, what good does this do the Republican party? You know, it's, and, and you must have some members of the state committee who will say that. And so you'll have a, I assume, a debate over this and there'll be people on both sides of the debate. And I'm happy to hear, you're shaking your head and I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, and, and, and the meeting is about, remember the resolution doesn't exist. It's more of a discussion. Okay, it's a discussion because there's no proposal for, uh, there's, there's no, here's a letter where you all vote yes or no on it. That's correct. Okay. And uh, where, I, where, where, where do you have your meetings in Augusta? Yeah, so let me explain something to you. Yeah. The letter both times, and, and, and it's not Mike Shepard's fault, he's just doing his job, but both times the letter that I sent to my state committee was taken, leaked, and when they when I was quoted in actuality, I never was quoted, but to Mike Shepard, they took the language of that email to my state committee and used it as as what I said. So so I, I have a little bit of an issue. Um, yeah. but that's that's a separate issue. That, that's because what the um, some members of my state committee want to do is fire up the issue. Um, so no, that's no, 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 let me ask you to, to clarify that for the audience. Yeah. I want to give you an opportunity to explain that. I didn't quite understand. Well, I don't know who Shepard is or anything like that. Oh, he's a so, he's a writer for Bangor Daily News. Okay, so there's a so Bangor Daily News writer did a story about it, and he attributed to you certain things that were not should not have been attributed to you. Well, it was just a leaked email from me to my state committee. Oh, okay. And in the leaked email, you said what? "Quote unquote," whatever I said to the to the members of the state committee, and it was attributed. You know, it, it was made to look like I actually was quoted, but in actuality, I never spoke to Bangor Daily News. Both issues, so oh, okay. it's it's just unfortunate. On the other side, let's look at it from a different point of view. Um, for example, I knew many of members that were going to to um, the Capitol the day of January sixth. I was at the RNC meeting in Amelia Island in Florida, so I wasn't even close. But uh, I did have people that I know quite well that did go to the Capitol. Didn't storm the Capitol, they were just at the Capitol. What unfortunately happened was some of these people uh, had visits paid by the FBI at their homes, uh, asked to look at their phones, and one person, a young person that decided to go, and again, these people plan these trips weeks ahead of time, not the day off. They weren't called by President Trump. They went on their own and they go there. They, one person was actually 1.4 miles away from the Capitol building itself. And yet the FBI looked over this poor young person's phone, looked at his pictures, looked at my text. And in the text, I was like, I'm here at the RNC meeting, get out of there now. I'm watching TV and I'm like scared, get out of there now. And the FBI were asking, who's Demi? Why is she telling you this? Was she involved? Did she recruit these people to go? So you can see where this is all going, the, the huge conspiracy. And so a lot of these folks in the state of Maine are talking and they feel that, you know, there was a conspiracy, there was an issue. And that's what, unfortunately, our senator has to deal with is the fact that the FBI paid a lot of visits to a lot of people's homes, looking for evidence to create a narrative that I was somehow involved. When I, you're I, involved. 
Yeah, that I was involved. About Demi. Okay. All right. Because uh, Demi called up this young person and said, I'm watching TV right now. Please get out of there now. Start walking as fast as your little legs can carry you and get out of there. I don't want you to have to be hurt because in the military and you and I were both in the military, you know, one, one of my favorite uh, comments that was told to me because I was in the medical corps was bullets have no names. When they right. fly, they fly. All right. Now, Demi, I just, I just, I want to make sure I understand it. So you, the, when did the FBI came to visit some people in Maine? Yes. After the, after the so-called insurrection, yes. not before. Okay, afterwards. So, and they came to people that they, that they thought were at the Capitol. Is Which they correct? were, because they were able to, to find without subpoenas, uh, records of possible purchases, airlines, and hotels. They, okay. they got to- So the FBI, so, okay, so the FBI is investigating who was at the Capitol, who stormed the Capitol. They're investigating. No, 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 not storm. Who went to the Capitol? Okay, because if people that, but all of the stormers, not all, not, not, not all the people who went stormed, but all of the stormers went. So they're looking for people who stormed the Capitol, and you first start with people who were at the Capitol. Yeah, well, they had pictures, but that's okay. And don't forget. Yeah. We RNC had two pipe bombs the night before that okay. we knew about. Yeah. So my question to you is, so the FBI came and interviewed people that you know in Maine. Correct. And wanted to know if they stormed the Capitol. And if they didn't storm the Capitol, nothing happened to them, right? They weren't no, indicted. But they, but they were harassed and they were without, you know, subpoenas were asked. They went through their phones, through the GPS, through their pictures, through their emails, and through their texts, of which I was one of them saying, get out of there. And they wanted to know what my, what I was doing calling them. So here we have a case of overly aggressive law enforcement. Yes, sir. All right. Overly aggressive. There are a lot of people, uh, others besides Republicans, who complain about overly aggressive law enforcement. I guess you would agree it exists. Sometimes I, law enforcement overly exercises its power, correct? Correct. Okay. So anyway, I take it you're, you're a little sore about that. I would be too. Uh, and, um, and they, they, they want to know who you were because they saw the messages. Demi. Demi says, start walking now. Get the blank out of there as fast as your little legs can carry you because I'm watching TV and I'm fearful for your life. Okay. And they, but incidentally, uh, it wasn't, it, 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 every, every, the, the people who went there planned to go there, January 6th. It, it was, a, I, I believe that uh, it was an organized thing. I mean, it, that January 6th was out there come to the Capitol, which is the day that the Congress was to certify the votes. Correct. Correct? Okay. And uh, so they went, you, do you know, you, you, I guess you do know why they, why the people that you, you know went to the Capitol on January 6th to, to be support part? The president, to support the president, just like they would go if there was a rally uh, yeah. anywhere in the country. They okay. didn't, they, their intent for a lot of these people was they were thinking this might be the last time they'd be able to see the president still be president in a rally. They were excited to see the president. So, um, tell me, this is, it's, it's, I, I, I can understand, uh, uh, certain things about uh, Trump, you know, he knows, he understands human nature. He understands it very well. And he's a showman and a promoter. And that's his strength in life, showmanship and promotion. And, um, but he's not a guy who's spent his life believing in fiscal responsibility. He doesn't care about that. And he, when he was president, it was nothing that he really uh, talked about. I don't think he ever talked about it. In terms of free market, well, the Republicans had always 
always been for free trade, no longer under him. So how does he have the Republican Party, which he was never really part of, in his spell? Is it as somebody, as some people suggest, that there is a lot of grievance and resentment among people, and he's sticking it in the eye of the elites, sticking his finger in the eye of the establishment Republicans. And they like that. They want a disruptor. And he delivered on what he, uh, what he promised he would do. Is this it? That's it? I, I think there was a void out there. I think there was a void out there of, of, of folks that felt they were underrepresented. They were the working man. Mm -hmm. The guy that got up every single morning, went to work, you know, was trying to, to make a go of it, help their families. And they felt that, they, that the, the politicians in, in Washington, D.C. were not listening to them. So I think that Trump came along and I think that he listened and he spoke, he, he spoke to that person. When you watch him speak, and I remember looking at videos of Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump, when he was speaking to them, he was actually talking to that person out in the audience. He was pointing the finger. He was including them. He was talking. Hillary would say, by not so much, I mean, we didn't see as much of the comparisons because Biden was sheltered in the basement. But what we didn't see is, is the fact that Hillary was to these folks, she called them deplorables, Walmart shoppers. Trump was talking to that segment and he, that segment believed him. He goes in there for four years and actually did a lot of um, you know, policies, which I personally think are great um, to basically um, you know, answer the call. A lot of his policies were in fact to help the average worker out there uh, in the United States that felt that they weren't being listened to. And what, like, an example of two or three of those policies? Oh, Lord. I, I think, you know, he was very supportive of, um, you know, you know law, law, lawmen, you know, that, that group. You mean like the FBI coming and visiting people at their Yeah, houses. yeah, yeah. The FBI does not belong <laughs> to Trump. We all know. <laughs> remember the Russia collusion? Yeah, you get the wrong group there. Uh, the average, the, remember, we're talking about the people out there in, uh, in uh, you know, in, in small Hicksville, Maine. We're talking about the, the police. We're talking about the, uh, the cops, we're talking about um, the union guy, we're talking about um, they, a lot of people, me being a, me being a veteran, uh, a lot of the people, I, I lived in Germany, we need to have our boys home from Germany, what are they doing there? The Germans don't want us there. Well, get, get our, our, get you know, we have the endless war in Afghanistan, get our boys home, get our people home. I shouldn't say boys, our boys and girls, because they're they're both uh, serving there. Get our folks home. End wars, um, uh, law and order, uh, late term abortion. For for once, we have somebody talking about late term abortion. That's a big deal for a lot of people, especially people like me. I, and I, you and I talked about it before. If there was a stray dog who was pregnant and due to have her puppies was euthanized along with her puppies, the outroll would be huge. And yet, you know, we we you know we call that. It's okay for a late-term late ab abortion to occur, which should never be okay. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, that's it. You don't have to go through the whole list. That's good oh, okay. enough. Okay, yeah, good. Thank you. You, you. you mentioned a lot of them. So look, but it, you mentioned unions. It's always intrigued me. Uh, the Republicans never did like unions in, yeah. traditionally. Yeah. And, they, uh, and Reagan set out to kind of destroy unions. And now we're left with what I disagree with, which is public employee unions. I'm, if, I'm for unions, but not public employee unions. But that's all we got left in this country. If okay. you're a working no, guy- No, we get, we get the teachers unions. Well, it's public employees. Oh, okay, yeah, you're right, all right. You're right. Public, public employees. So uh, so that's what we, we, we got left. And so 
when you talk about people not having power in the 50s and 60s, I can tell you because I'm old. All right, unions were very powerful and people did not feel disenfranchised, did not feel they didn't have power because the union had power. And, you know, I've never, I'll never forget uh, the um, um, UPS. The UPS drivers were making, you know, $80,000 a year in those days, strong union. Everybody said, look, that's union so strong. It's terrible. It's, you know, they're, they're making too much money and so forth. The yeah. fact is that unions were very helpful in creating a middle class. No question about it. Yes. So now, Demi, an hour goes very, very fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been terrific. I've enjoyed having you on. You know, the other thing, Demi, because I don't, you and I don't agree on much, but uh, I, I like the fact that you explain yourself, that you have passion for your views, you have passion for your political party, you do a good job, and you're an excellent spokesman for the Republican Party. Thank you. That, that means a lot coming from you, because I know you're a, you're a tough guy. Everybody tells me, you're going on with Harold Pages, oh my Lord. <laughs> you, asked, you asked Paul LePage. I had Paul LePage on, and when I finished with Paul LePage, he said, anytime you want to do this. Wow. We'll do yeah, so incidentally, Paul LePage and Donald Trump own the Republican Party of Maine, the two of them together. Trump won it and Trump too. They own it. Here's, here's what amazes me. They're not trying to be nice to people. They're not, they don't, they insult a lot of people. Uh, but boy, they are both of them popular. If Paul LePage runs for the Republican nomination, he'll get it for sure. And next time, if Donald Trump runs in 2024 for the Republican nomination, he'll get it. It's a phenomenon. And you're shaking your head like I'm not crazy. No, you're definitely not crazy. And I tell everybody, I said, at the end of the day, if you need major open heart surgery, are you going to go out? You're going to go for the really nice guy with a good bedside manner? Or are you going to go for the best surgeon out there? That's true. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. We'll, we'll leave it at that, Demi. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate Thanks. it. We, I learned a lot, and I'm sure the audience did too. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.